11 o'clock. Welcome everyone. We've got 31 who've joined right now. We're supposed to have, I think, like 41. So I'm going to have to go through and take a look at who's connecting on time and who's joining late and start to uh, maybe encourage people to join us on time. That's the best way to learn is to be in the class and not miss the announcements. You know, these announcements will help keep you on track and make sure that you don't uh, forget about a homework assignment or something like that. So I um, hope everybody's doing well. Let's uh, take a look at the assignments. First of all, homework zero is uh, due today by 2 p.m. And remember, that's a bonus assignment. So maybe saying that it's due isn't quite right because, uh, you know, it's optional. You get 10 bonus points for the homework if you do it. And what you need to do is uh, connect with me on Teams. And so uh, I've demonstrated, demonstrated previously how to, what the steps are to do that. And I think people are figuring it out. I've got probably so far between my two classes that I teach, I probably had 30 calls come through. And uh, if I can't pick up, then I may need to decline your call. So just try again later if it's during my office hours. Um, I ended up getting a call for a, a different class, I think, uh, last night around I don't know, like 5.15 and I was still in the office, so I'll try and take them as long as I can. Uh, homework number one, which has to do with interest, that assignment's available now on Blackboard, and so you can get started with that. Remember that since you're going to be solving these calculations by hand on a piece of paper, but you're submitting it electronically, you have to convert that handwritten calculation into a PDF file. So please upload the PDF file to Blackboard. Uh, sometimes Blackboard's called MU Online, so sorry if I sometimes use those two terms interchangeably. Upload the uh, PDF file to Blackboard uh, before class on Wednesday, and you can use a flatbed, cam scanner, Adobe's app, you know, however you can turn that into a single black and white PDF file, and that's the approach that you should take. Any questions related to the announcements? Feel free to unmute and uh, ask a question if you've got one related to the announcements. Um, we don't have time right now to, to address specific questions from the homework itself, um, but if you do have a question about like the scheduling or anything related to that, we could go over it. All right. So, in the in-class exercise we did on Wednesday, I kind of threw some questions out at you without the background first. And that's kind of a technique that I sometimes use just to see, you know, like, what can we figure out without the fundamentals? Well, let's get into the fundamentals today. I'll give you the background. I'll tell you about the accepted notation and the convention for how we uh, kind of visualize these um, time value of money problems. And then we'll come back to those same questions in in-class exercise number three. Hopefully you've printed out the in-class exercises and printed out the notes. I've suggested before that you should get a three-ring binder to keep all your materials for this class. It's going to be really uh, urgently important for you to keep organized. And so the best way to do that is have all the papers in one place. So hopefully you've done that. All right, so a cash flow diagram is a way to graphically represent what may otherwise need to be expressed as text. And, uh, you know, the calculations we do this summer, they're not that complicated. They're simple formulas. And sometimes where students go awry is just translating the word problem into the calculations. I mean, I've had trouble with that myself, sometimes interpreting and trying to understand, well, what, what do they mean when they say, 6% or, you know, uh, when you borrow the 10,000, uh, you know, whose perspective is that and so on. So the purpose of a cash flow diagram is to take statements and visualize it in a way that you can understand what's happening just at a glance rather than having to read and kind of digest the text. A cash flow diagram summarizes the problem a lot more quickly. And so our typical convention is that when we are considering the situation from our perspective, then anytime you get money, it's going to be diagrammed as an arrow above the line. And anytime you pay money, it's diagrammed as an arrow below the line. So here, 
obviously um, the horizontal line represents the passage of time. And so here the zero represents the present. This is now. And then the one is going to be um, one period in the future. Sometimes the period is a year. Sometimes the period of time that we're talking about is a month, and it could even be a week or a day. It doesn't really matter. It's just from the problem statement, we have to look and see, like, what's the unit of time? In the text that I've put on the screen there, where you're borrowing $10,000 at 6%, from that statement, you can see that our time period is years. And so in this case, the, uh, the horizontal line and each of the tick marks represents a year. So we would represent a problem like this by putting arrows on the line. So you borrow $10,000. If you're borrowing it, from, from your perspective, you go to the bank and you walk out of the bank with $10,000. And so you have had an inflow of, ca of cash. So in this previous slide, money you get is called inflow, and money you pay is called outflow. So you got $10,000, and it's a solid line to represent that that's a known amount. P, the, uh, the label that's on there, represents a present value, meaning that it's an amount that is at time zero. It's today. And the question is saying, how much must be repaid? And so you can see that here in year five, we have an arrow down. So the significance of that, remember, is an arrow that's below the line represents an outflow where we're having to pay someone. It's a dashed line to kind of draw attention to the fact that we don't know the amount. That's just one way to, uh, to emphasize that it's an unknown amount. And of course, the other way that we're emphasizing it's an unknown amount is with these question marks next to the label. F means that we're solving for some future value, and we don't know how much. And then you can see the applicable interest rate is just put somewhere in the proximity of this cash flow diagram. It doesn't always have to be above the line. It could be below the line or to the side if needed. But just somewhere in that visual representation, what we've done is we've identified the annual interest rate that applies. In this case, it's an annual interest rate because our periods are years in duration. So you notice the labels, the P and the F. To be 100% correct, if I ask you to make a cash flow diagram, you need to put those labels on. Otherwise, your cash flow diagram is not complete. If you just put the amounts without the labels, the cash flow diagram is just not quite there yet. And it may seem silly or redundant because I mean, it's obvious that the $10,000 is at the present because we know time zero is the present. So why be redundant like that and make it so explicit, you may wonder. Well, the reason is because uh, when we start using formulas, the formulas have P and F, A and I, you know, the, the, the variables that exist in those formulas, it's just handy if we have the variables and the amounts kind of tied together in the graphical representation as well as when we start substituting it in to the formulas themselves. So here you can see P equals 10,000 and having it there on the picture is going to make it easier to substitute into the correct formula. So that's why uh, to be 100% correct, you need to include the labels as well as the amounts on a cash flow diagram. Okay, so this is our convention. Any questions about the specific components of this cash flow diagram. You're going to be drawing a lot of these this semester. Now, uh, lined paper, like I've got some lined paper here. It's not very good for cash flow diagrams, especially if you're going to be scanning this. The problem with using lined paper is if you take a picture and turn it into a PDF, it not only has your sketch, but then it's got all these extra lines on it. And it's going to be kind of just sloppy and distracting to have the extra lines. And so my suggestion is that you either just use a blank piece of printer paper to do your sketches, or even better, if you've used engineering computation paper before. Um, 
if you go to into a, a specialty stationery store, um, like the, the bookstore here on campus has engineering computation paper. I wish I had some handy. I've just moved into a new office, and so I don't have everything out. But what it is, engineering computation paper is like graph paper, but it only has um, lines and, and grids on the back side of the paper. So that on the front side, it doesn't have the grid. And so that when you scan it or take a picture of it, you don't actually see the grid. The grid is like in the background and it's very faint. So if you've already done your assignment on lined paper this time around, it's okay. I haven't told you yet that you shouldn't use lined paper. But moving forward, just do it on blank paper or make the investment and get that engineering computation paper. I'll try and get my hands on some so I can show you what it looks like. It's usually like got a, uh, a greenish or a yellow tint to make it like more easy on the eyes and more official somehow. But the, the key idea is that it's got uh, a bunch of grids on the back and then they don't show through when you scan it or make photocopy. All right. So inflows, we sometimes also call revenues or receipt, income. This is money that's coming to you. And another category of a cash inflow is when you've done something to, gen uh, to save money. So for instance, if I am driving a truck that's fuel efficient, fuel inefficient, you know, like I used to have an old Dodge that got about seven miles per gallon. So I was spending a bundle on gas. Anytime I drive that thing, I was just thinking about all the money I'd spend on gas. Well, if you switch to a different car and you're not having to spend on fuel anymore, then the savings that's generated by that switch you can think of in terms of being an inflow. So it's not like you're actually getting money from the outside, but it's money you used to spend that you're not spending anymore. So that can also be classified as a cash inflow when we are putting things onto a cash flow diagram. You know, for example, if you're going to make an investment today to save money in the future, then that's an illustration of when we're putting together a cash flow diagram, something that would be an inflow. So we give it a plus sign in calculations. It's above the line in a cash flow diagram. Outflows, by contrast, are sometimes called disbursements, costs, expenses. It can include things like taxes. And so a minus sign is used in the formulas. And when we're combining values together, and it's below the cash flow diagram. So the difference between inflow and outflow is called the net cash flow. And the net cash flow is going to be the revenue minus the disbursements. And so hopefully if you're operating a business, you have a positive net cash flow. A lot of companies, especially tech companies, in their early years have a negative net cash flow. And now we think about Amazon as one of the most uh, successful and wealthy companies in the world, but for more than a decade, Amazon was losing money every quarter, every month, every day Amazon was losing money because they were selling things more cheaply than it cost them to obtain them. It was their long-term strategy to get us addicted to the convenience of having things delivered to our home without having to get into the car and drive to the store. So they had negative net cash flows at Amazon for a long time. But people were patient. The investors uh, kept the long view in mind. And then now they've been rewarded handsomely as Amazon is profitable these days. Now, here's an important thing. Um, <clears throat> we sometimes will take all of the revenue and all of the expenses that a company experiences during a certain period and we'll cluster it together at the end of that period. So for example, if you do your budget on a monthly basis and you know that you've got a water bill, an electric bill, and a telephone bill, um, rather than trying to put together a cash flow diagram that shows the exact day and moment in time that you have those outflows, oftentimes we'll just push all of those expenses to the end of the month. And then if we're drawing a cash flow diagram, we'd have one arrow at the end of the period that shows expenses and same with revenue. You know, if you're 
operating a company and some of your revenue comes in on the first of the month, some of it comes on the 10th, some of it comes on the 20th of the month, it's typical to aggregate all of that together and just do like once per period summary of inflows and outflows. And so the assumption here is that we'll aggregate those together and then we'll represent them on the cash flow diagram at the end of the period. So we'll get some experience applying all of this terminology, but I just wanted to define these terms for you so far. Any questions before we continue? Okay, here's a, uh, another way to look at a cash flow diagram. It can continue as far into the future as we need. And so if the, uh, if the statement that we're translating to a diagram makes it clear that these receipts are being received for 10 years, then we'd need to make sure that we have at least 10 annual tick marks on the cash flow diagram. And uh, unless otherwise defined in the problem statement, we're always going to apply that end of period assumption that I've just mentioned. And so all of the... Uh, all of the money is aggregated to the end of the period. And so sometimes what's confusing to people is, um, is thinking about where to put the line on the cash flow diagram based on how many years it's been. So think about if the problem says two years from now you'll receive a revenue of $100. What you do is you'd say, all right, now is zero. So one year from now, two years from now, so I put the line above there on the number two. So the number two represents the end of the second year. Now this is maybe even more confusing is that time zero, the present, is the beginning of the first year. And then here at the number one, that's the end of the first year and the beginning of the second year. And so the year is the time in between the tick marks. The tick marks themselves are just an instant in time. So now is time zero. One is a year from now. So the, the space in between is the passage of time. It's that first year. So if I say that during the second year a certain thing is happening, that means between the end of the first and the end of the second is that time in between. And so whatever happens during the second year, by default, we would put at the end of the second year and represent it on the cash flow diagram that way. Uh, another thing that we would typically try and do is where possible, we show the length of the arrow to represent the approximate magnitude of the amount. So if you know that you have to pay $80 today and you're going to receive $100 in the future, the line for the $100 should be a little bit longer than the line for the $80. You don't have to get a ruler out and be accurate to the nearest millimeter. I, I'm, nobody's expecting that. But you know, if it's a lot of money, the arrow should be a little bit longer than if it's a little bit of money. So the arrows represent the approximate amount. The symbols that we've already introduced is that I represents the interest rate per period. And some problems you will be calculating the, uh, the interest on an annual basis, sometimes it may be quarterly, and so on. It's most common to describe interest on an annual basis. And so um, in this statement that's here. It says you borrow $10,000 at 6% and then in parentheses it says compounded annually. Even if it didn't say that, even if it didn't say compounded annually, it's assumed that the 6% is compounded annually. That's the most typical thing. And so early in the semester right now where we're still kind of getting the feel for how all of this works, I may give you additional uh, reinforcing language that I don't choose to include in the future because just the, the typical convention is that interest is expressed on an annual basis and that's assumed and so I'll start to be progressively less explicit about the assumptions because you're going to start just picking up 
what's the typical convention, and you won't need those uh, guidelines and the reinforcing language quite as much. So n is the number of periods, and here, as it says, the periods could be years, months, days, just however often the interest is being compounded. P is present. F is future. We're going to have other things in addition to P and F. There are also annual series and gradients. So we'll talk about those in turn. So the way that we would break down this problem statement and assign its variables, P is 10,000, I is 6% per year, N is 5 years, F unknown. That's just translating the problem statement into its symbols. Here's an annual series. I just mentioned it a moment ago. Um, an annual series exists when the amount is the same in each of the years that apply. So here you can see that you're receiving $150,000 a year for six years in a row at the end of each year. That sounds great, doesn't it? I'd love to get $150,000 each year for six years. Um, this is a point estimate. Now, oftentimes in engineering economy, we don't exactly know in the future how much revenue we're going to get. You know, when a company is planning a new product, uh, they may have estimates about how many units they're selling. You know, if you're going into the business of selling um, rulers, you know, metal rulers, you're going to go into the metal, metal ruler business, you know, your marketing and market research team may estimate how many they think you can sell at a given price. And uh, so you can express that future amount as a point, or sometimes if there's some uncertainty behind that estimate, we can use a range instead. You know, rather than just assuming we're definitely going to get $150,000 six years in the future, and you know, that's a long time in the future to be trying to estimate with that kind of precision. If you want to express the range of values that you think are likely, then a range estimate maybe would be one way to do that, to capture it. So here you can see what we are saying is we think that in the future we're going to get between $135,000 and $150,000 each year. So um, what we could do is you know, if we're going to build a factory to make these metal rulers, let's analyze, is it worth doing if we only get $135,000 a year? You know, a so-called worst case scenario versus is it worth doing if we get the top end of that estimate, $150,000? And so an uncertainty analysis would be to consider the entire spectrum of possibilities. You know, if your marketing team tells you, well, it's 95% certain that we're going to get between 135 and 150,000 each year. And if you have confidence in that, then you could do the range uh, estimate and analyze whether to move forward with the project based on the range of values rather than point values. Okay, let's get some practice with this. Um, I have don't want to show you that yet. Uh, I have. Uh, previously uploaded the in-class exercise to Blackboard. And these are some of the same problems that we kind of uh, went blind with last time. Uh, so in-class exercise three includes some of these same questions. And we already saw the cash flow diagram solutions to one and two. So let me just bring those up again and uh, reinforce what we saw before. Uh, let me scoot up to that. All right. So in problem one, it was saying to sketch the uh, following statement. Today you receive 10000 from the bank, and then one year from today you make four annual payments to the bank in the amount of 3300 So you receive, which means it's above the line. We put the label on there and the amount, 10000 And then starting one year from today, so that means here at the tick mark of one is a year from today, and four annual payments in the amount of 3300 So that's going to be the same amount. You know, it, it doesn't say anything about the amount is increasing or decreasing, and so that means it's the same. And uh, there are going to be four of them. So at line one, two, three, and four. So we already saw that one. 
the other one that we looked at is um, you save 110,000 at the end of each year for six years, and at the end of the seventh year, we, you withdraw the balance. The amount is not yet known. So if we consider that from two different perspectives, if you consider it from your perspective and from the bank's perspective, it's going to be the mirror image of those when we change perspectives. So just to refresh your memory of what we saw on Wednesday with that, your perspective is you're saving 10000 Now here, it doesn't mean that this is an expense that you used to be spending. This means that you're depositing it into the bank. And then at the end of the seventh year, you withdraw the balance. So we have to kind of read this whole statement to know what they, were, know, what they mean by the word save. Here, save means deposit. Remember, uh, in the notes I was saying that sometimes when you uh, have a reduction in your expenses, that that can also be counted as an inflow. In this case, it's not a reduction of previously incurred expenses. It's that you know, you're saving the money by depositing it into a bank at the end of each year for six years. And then you withdraw some unknown amount. So if this is your perspective, then the bank, what they see is that they have six annual deposits, meaning that's an inflow to them. And then they have an outflow at the end of the seventh year. All right. So I'm going to stop talking for now because what I'd like you to do is translate this cash flow diagram into a cash flow table. A cash flow table is just a way of translating either the word statement or the cash flow diagram, which is graphical, into something that's tabular. And since we're going to be using Microsoft Excel quite a lot this semester, it's really important that you be able to turn visual data or text data into a table. So I'm going to pause for a moment and give you a chance to translate the given inflows and outflows into this table and include the net cash flow amounts. If in one year it has both an inflow and an outflow, then the net cash flow is going to be the difference between those two. So I'll stop talking for a moment so that you can uh, write that down and then I'll bring up the solution to see if we're all on the same page together. Attraction. Let me pull up the solution to this one. All right. Oh, man, my handwriting's sloppy. That's embarrassing. I can't believe I'm bringing this up on screen and saving it for YouTube. I'll be humiliated the entire world over. All right. So um, what we've got is uh, inflows. It looks like for years one through five, it's $2,000 each year. And then year six, seven, and eight, our inflow is 3000 and then we have just a couple of single F values for the outflows. Remember that these first two series were annual series. So that means that's a recurring amount. And you'll notice that in the diagram, the arrow was a little bit longer for the second series. And so that's an important way for us to clarify, you know, how many years was it the 2000 amount and how many years was it the 3000 amount? If we made those arrows like almost exactly the same length, then it wouldn't be clear enough on which years gets which amounts. So uh, when we do the subtraction, it looks like our net cash flow is going to be 2000 2000 and then only 500 in the third year. Because in that third year, we have some expense, whether it's a maintenance of equipment or maybe refurbishing something. Whatever that expense is, it's reducing our net cash flow in that year. And in fact, in the sixth year, we end up with a negative net cash flow because our expenses outweigh our revenue just in that single year. So those are how we calculate our net cash flows. Any questions on that table? OK. So uh, in class example number three, problem four. Today you receive $25,000 from the bank, and in three years you pay the bank $30,000. Draw a cash flow diagram from the bank's perspective. So the problem is describing what happens to you, but think about how they're going to see it. 
when you do these things. And be sure to include the labels. So work on that one. And if you want to jump ahead to uh, trying out question five, you can also work on that if you do problem four real quick. But we'll separately talk about problem five in just a moment. All right, so from the bank's perspective, how do things look? If you get 25000 that must mean that they're paying it out. So today, the bank is paying out 25000 And then in three years, if you pay the bank 30000 that means from their perspective, they are receiving 30000 in three years. All right, so here's the bank's perspective. Today they have to pay out 25000 and we put the P there to represent that it's occurring in the present. And then to emphasize that this revenue of 30000 in the future is an inflow and it's in the future, we give it the F and the arrow is up. Okay. Now, this last question, this is kind of like a, a stretch question, so to speak. You know, we haven't yet addressed all of the uh, underlying fundamentals and concepts here, but I'm just going to throw this against the wall and see what sticks. Here's a formula that you have seen before in a previous class, and it allows you to calculate a future amount based on the present value, an interest rate, and the number of years that the interest is compounding. Okay, so in the cash flow diagram, it's showing us uh, an amount that we receive in year zero and an amount we receive in year one. And we're going to have to pay back some amount at the end of the fifth year. So it looks like this is a two-stage loan. Right now we get 10000 then next year we get 5000 and then we have to pay it back with interest five years in the future. So the question is that this is asking, like this, this diagram is saying how much do we have to pay after five years if this has been compounding at 6%. So what it isn't is it's not just going to be 15000 we have to pay back. You know, a bank wouldn't do that. They're not going to give you money now to be repaid the same exact amount in the future. You know, they want to be compensated for the risk that they undertook and they want to be compensated for the time value of money. Because what's happening is inflation, which means the constant increase in prices, inflation is eroding the value of dollars. So that $10,000 now is more valuable than $10,000 five years in the future. I mean, just think of it this way. If you had to choose between $10,000 now and $10,000 in the future, what would you take? Well, it's more, and it's more than just immediate gratification. I think a lot of us would take the money now just because it's, it's more fun to spend money now than spend money in the future. But also, you can get more with $10,000 now than you will be able to in the future. Like whether you're buying, um, you know, corn or lumber or a car, um, because prices keep inflating over time, you just won't be able to have the same purchasing power five years in the future with that ten thousand dollars. And so one of the things that um, companies, uh, like banks, are going to require is that uh, that they be paid a little extra. Gas prices, who's to, who knows, five years in the future, whether gas is going to be more expensive or less expensive. It's, I think, cheaper now than it was five years ago, but it's a very unpredictable market. All right, so I'm going to stop talking and see if you've got some thoughts on what to do with this. You've got two amounts, and we want to find out what's the future equivalent. So I'll give you a hint. You're going to use this equation two times and then add the result together. So with that hint and with the equation, I'm going to pause for another moment, give you a chance to crunch some numbers and see if you can find out what's the combined amount that you owe based on the, uh, the amounts that you'll be receiving now and one year in the future.
there. All right. So how much do we owe? Uh, maybe a pixie, <laughs> Tinkerbell. All right. So um, we got to pay back this loan. How much is it going to be if every year 6% is growing? Now, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, what you could say is, all right, 10000 and after one year, how much do we owe? We owe the 10000 and 6% on top. And then we add that amount to the 5000 and we say, all right, now an additional 6% is owed in year two. And then find the total, add another 6% at the end of the third year, add another 6% at the end of the fourth year. And so you could row by row kind of calculate the interest and watch it snowballing and accumulating. That's one way to calculate the future value. The problem said to try using the formula. So let me show you what the solution looks like for that one. All right. So there's two parts here. There's the $10,000 that's going to be compounded five years into the future, each year getting 6% interest. And then there's the $5,000 that isn't going to be compounded the same number of years. It's only compounding four years into the future. So as many of our colleagues identified, the amount you're going to have to pay the bank at the end of the fifth year is 19,694. Okay. So any questions about today's in-class exercise? I actually um, did uh, that problem a little bit differently. I basically um, did 10,000, I did the formula for 10,000 as the principal and the interest rate, and then I only did it for one year. Okay. And then I basically had the new principal, which is whatever I got from the formula, plus 5,000. Yep. That's all the principal, and then do it for four years. Exactly. That's great. That's perfect. So I think if you compound the 10,000 one year into the future, it's 10,600, right? Yeah. So you took the 10,600, added 5,000 to it, so now we're talking 15,600, and then you're taking 15,600 and compounding that for four years. And that's, that'll get you the same result. I will mention that when you're doing problems like these, uh, don't round off too soon. Uh, people expect that financial calculations will be accurate to the nearest penny. Like you'd be kind of annoyed at your bank if your bank statement came and they said, well, you got about 19,600. You'd say, well, what are you talking about? About. I want to know to the penny what I have in the account. So we're going to have to follow the same thing. We're going to be accurate to the nearest penny. And so, you know, at the very end, if, you, if the problem says to round to the nearest dollar or round to the nearest thousand, then we can. But in all of our intermediate calculations, we need to make sure that uh, we're keeping all the precision in the calculator and are accurate to the nearest cent. And James makes the observation, never take out loans. Amen to that. Only borrow money that you absolutely have to and only do it for a really good reason. Otherwise... Um, they say that people who understand compound interest loan money and people who don't understand compound interest borrow money. Because once you understand how that loan can snowball and the interest just keep piling up and then you have to pay interest on top of the interest, uh, it's really oppressive. Okay, let's take a look at our announcements just to make sure we're all on the same page before we part ways. What you are doing is, if you haven't already, you're going to call me on Teams by 2 o'clock today. And then uh, I'd encourage you to go ahead and get started on homework number one. You need to submit that before class on Wednesday. And so we've gone over enough material that you should be able to get through quite a lot of that assignment. There may still be a couple of concepts that we're still going to address on Monday. But uh, yeah, go ahead and get started. Print out the notes. Get the book. Print out the in-class exercises. You get some of those things out of the way, and then we're going to be sailing and on cruise control towards success. So that's it for today. I hope everybody has a great weekend, and uh, I'll see you 
virtually on Monday, if not before on Teams. That's it. Bye-bye.